thank you with thank you for sharing with us today. We're going into our Bible study, and we've been looking, as you remember, about uh, mentors and about people who they are mentoring, and the importance that that is. And it gives us some uh, impetus to be mentors for uh, uh, other Christians, uh, baby Christians, Christians who are trying to grow, uh, just doing what it is that God wants us to do. And so that's a very important aspect of this. And we've looked at. Uh, Moses, Jethro, Joshua, Moses, Samuel, Nehemiah, and now we're going to look at Esther and Mordecai. I don't know if you ever uh, read the book of Esther. It's an exciting book, and there's a lot in that that really uh, reads like a drama. So it's very easy reading. If you haven't read it, just read the whole book. It's not very long, and it will really give you some insights into how God works and how God wants us to work. So let's uh, let's begin then with a word of prayer, and you can turn with me to Esther uh, chapter 2 is where we're going to start today. Thank you, Lord, for the book of Esther and for the way that she radiated her beauty and uh, became the, uh, the uh, queen and was able to use that position for her people. Help us, Lord, to use the position that you've given us in life to help other people in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so um, let, let's uh, turn with me then to chapter 2, verse 5 of, of Esther. Now, just to kind of uh, set the stage, a long time ago, Assyria uh, attacked Israel, which were, they were, that was the northern kingdoms, uh, and then there were the southern kingdoms, but they attacked them and took them into captivity, basically. Uh, in about 722, Babylon came along, or about 586, Babylon came along and took into captivity the two southern kingdoms, which was known as Judah. So Israel was already in captivity, and now Judah was going into captivity into Babylon. Uh, during that time, Persia became the greatest nation and overtook Babylon. And so we find ourselves at that particular time frame, and we have a girl named, in, in, in verse uh, 5, it says, Now in Shushan, the palace, there was a certain Jew whose name was Mordecai, the son of Jair, the son of Shemai, the son of Kish, a Benjamite. Uh, we're going to find out, Esther, she did have a different name, but we'll look at that in just a minute. But first of all, we're going to look at Mordecai. That's who. That's where we're starting. He was a Jewish man. He seemed to be very faithful. He seemed to be doing, you know, the things that he was supposed to be doing. They gave a rundown on his, on his genetics and where he came from, his descendants. Um, I'm not going to go into that, but you can... Just to Google that, and it'll tell you all about it and what it has to do with what's going on. But it's we don't have just that much time to go into every detail on everything. But anyway, uh, who had been carried away from Jerusalem with the captivity, which had been carried away with Jeconiah, king of Judah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, had carried away. So uh, he was taken into captivity when Babylon or Babylonia came down and, and took the two southern kingdoms and took them in captivity. That's when Mordecai was taken. And then since then, the Persians defeated the Babylonians. And so now we're in that time frame where Persia is, um, uh, is world leader, and especially uh, in the northern parts there of the Middle East. Uh, okay, and so he said that he'd been carried away and Nebuchadnezzar was the king. That's a very prominent name. We come across that quite often in scriptures. Um, so he was the king, uh, and and uh, then verse seven he says, and he brought up uh, Hadassa. If you'll see that in verse seven, that is the name for guess who? Right, it's the name for Esther. Esther is a, a Greek name or a Persian name that probably came from the uh, the god uh, the goddess Istar. Um, anyway. It, we find out that Mordecai was her uncle, and he had, or actually her cousin, and he had taken her on because her parents were killed, and he took her on to mentor her and to take care of her needs. Um, it says um, that that he brought her up. That is Esther, his uncle's daughter. So this was his uncle's daughter, which would make it make her his cousin, for she had neither father nor mother, and the maid was fair and beautiful whom Mordecai, when her father and mother were dead, took for his own daughter. So we, we have here kind of the beginnings of this, and we see that Mordecai came to the forefront. There was a need that needed to be met. He knew that Esther, uh, you know, was 
you know, a human being and that she maybe had a place in God's world, God's work. And so he, he kind of adopted her as his own daughter, it says. Um, and, uh, and wait just a minute now. I'll, I'll put up my first thing. I want to wait for just a second. Um, so verse 8. It says, also he gave him the copy of the writing of the decree that was given at Shushan to destroy them, to show it unto Esther and to declare it unto her and to charge her that she should go in unto the king to make supplication uh, unto him. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch. Ugh. That's the King James. You may like that better, but to me it's a little wordy and what have you, and it's just easier to understand if we uh, use the... Um, the, uh, this is what most Southern Baptist literature is done in the uh, Christian Standard Bible. Uh, and so it said that uh, Mordecai, uh, in verse 8, Mordecai also gave him a copy of the written decree issued in Susa, ordering their destruction, so that Hathach might show it to Esther, explain it to her, and command her to approach the king, implore his favor, and plead with him personally for her people. Uh, Hathach came and repeated Mordecai's response to Esther. Okay, so what's going on here is that uh, there was a, uh, you know, a particular arrogant ruler uh, of the Persians, and he wanted everybody to bow down to him. And, um, uh, and uh, uh, Mordecai refused to. And so that really made him mad. And so he said, okay, because you won't bow down to me, I'm going to sentence you to death. In fact, I'm going to set out some kind of rule, some kind of law, get it made to where we're going to kill uh, all the Jewish people. And we're going to do it on this particular date. And so that was, you know, quite a, a phenomenon that showed up because Mordecai himself refused to worship uh, the, the uh, you know, this particular individual. And uh, maybe, I don't know, maybe you've heard of his name before, but we'll see at the end what happens. And um, let me see here. I want to see what, what name. He, he, he goes by different names. I don't want to confuse you. Um, the name that I uh, found out that he went with was um, Hanan. But let me see. Yeah, they don't really. And your lesson doesn't really go into that. But anyway, he was, uh, he was an individual. Like I say, you can read all of Esther. It's a very uh, easy read. It's, it reads like a novel. Um, and so anyway, uh, Mordecai gave a copy of this written decree so that Hathach, who is the um, servant of Esther, gave it to, to Hathach to give it to, to Esther. Now, Esther became the queen of Persia, Nebuchadnezzar's wife. And the reason why is because Nebuchadnezzar had a big party and his one wife named Vishta, he told her to parade in front of everybody because he was so proud of her and wanted people to look at her in awe, etc. But she was a little, I don't really know why she didn't. If she was uh, shy, it doesn't really say, the Bible doesn't say that. Uh, probably she was, uh, she just was not going, she was too proud to parade herself around, so she refused to do it. And so Nebuchadnezzar picked another queen. And there were a lot of people, a lot of women who were in line to be a queen. And one of them was Esther. And Esther, it said, the Bible says here that she was very beautiful and she you know, was good looking in the face and she was built very nice. And so uh, she was, you know, very attractive and, uh, and, and an easy choice for Nebuchadnezzar to select. And so he did. He didn't know she was a Jew at the time, but that's neither here nor there. But anyway, he selected her to be his new queen, and she became his queen. And so she had this high um, office in the land of Persia. And you remember Mordecai got this law now that they were going to uh, have all the Jews slaughtered. And so it was going to be, you know, a bad deal. And he had to work through, through the king to try to get that particular um, uh, day of slaughter amended or strike it off the books. And so he had a plan that he was going to use in order to do this. Now, he's, um, we, so, so we'll see here as we go through the story that, that God works through all the people. God works through all the people. And we'll see all the people that he works through. 
He's, he's going to work through the Persian people as well as the Jewish people. He's going to work through the servants as well as the queen. Uh, he works through the king as well as he works through just the, the ordinary normal citizen. And so it said here that uh, that uh, Hatach then got, got what uh, Mordecai was saying and wanted, uh, wanted Hatach to give that information to Esther. Esther spoke to Hatach and commanded him to tell Mordecai, all the royal officials, this is verse 11, all the royal officials and the people of the royal provinces know that one law applies to every man or woman who approaches the king in the inner courtyard and who has not been summoned. The death penalty, unless the king extends the gold scepter, allowing that person to live. So, Hathach is asking uh, Esther to go before the king and to ask the king to get rid of this writ that 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 uh, Haman has has uh, caused and has uh, put out against the Jewish people. And she says her response is, "Oh yes, I would love to do that. I'm the queen." I, I think I can do that. I think I can talk him into it. But instead, she said, look, whenever you go to the king, because a lot of people go to him, and a lot of them have uh, poor reasons for going to him, he doesn't want to be bothered with all that. So he, he'll kill you. He'll have you killed if it's not an important edict, if it's not an important uh, question, if it's not an important uh, subject matter. And so she said, I'm kind of afraid to go to him. Even being the queen, she was afraid to go to him. Exactly why that was, uh, here's here's what it said. Um, she she says uh, that that I, I haven't been to see him for three months. Um, unless the king extends a gold scepter, this is in verse uh, eleven, allowing that person to live. I have not been summoned to appear before the king for the last thirty days. So not three months, but thirty days. So she's saying. Uh, if I go in there and I and I talk about this, and if he does not find that it is important, he'll have me killed. He could hold out the golden scepter, and that would that would save me. But uh, if he doesn't, then then I could be killed. And, and this uh, she hadn't talked to him for thirty days seems to indicate that maybe they were on the outs or something. You know, I'm not for sure. You'd say, well, why would he kill his own queen? Well, a lot of things happened back in those violent days, and we don't really have the answers for all that. But she was afraid that that was going to be the case, so there must be some validity to it. So she was afraid to stand up and tell the king about uh, about uh, Haman and about the problems and difficulties that were going to come upon the Jews, because she was afraid that she would be put to death because her request may be found, you know, too unimportant. Um, so, so she she told um, uh, uh, Haman that, I mean, uh, hashtag that, hat that told told him that, and he went back and he told this to Mordecai, and Mordecai told the messenger to reply to Esther. Now, this is the important part of the, the book. Don't think that you will escape the fate of all the Jews because you are in the king's palace. If you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's family will be destroyed. Who knows, perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Uh, you, know, you know, really, you know, very insightful information that he has given to, to her. And he's saying, number one, don't let fear control you. Don't let fear control you. And then we go on to say, you have a place in God's plan. You have a place in God's plan, and so do you, and we all do. God has given us a particular place to be vigilant in his plan and to carry it out. Now, you, you know, you, you know about the gifts of the Spirit that Paul talks about, and he says everybody has at least one gift, and he gives these to all the people in the church, not for themselves, not for their own edification, but instead to use them for the edification of all the other people. 
And he said, some of you may say, well, I'm an ear, and so I'm not as important as the eye, or I'm just a foot, and so I'm not important as some of the other parts. And Paul said, everybody is equally important. You know, if you don't do what God has called you to do, then you're going to not fulfill the needs of the body, and they're not going to be as strong. The body's not going to be as strong as it could be. I knew a guy who had his uh, big toe cut off, and he never had a replacement or anything else because it wasn't deemed really necessary. But he said his balance has been off ever since that, one little member of his foot, and it caused his whole balance to be thrown off. So when you say, well, God has not given me a very important gift, I don't sing well, and I can't teach, and, and you know, I can't, uh, I'm not a good evangelist, and, and, you know, I can't do this, I can't do that. But you can do something. You can do something great. You can do anything to a degree, but there are some things that you're specifically blessed to do, and God has given you those gifts, and he's saying to use them. And that's what we see here, that you have a place in God's plan, no matter what it may be. Uh, one day you're going to get to heaven and you're going to see all kinds of people up there who you don't even know that became Christians and went to heaven because of you. It's because you talked to somebody else or because you ministered to somebody else and they ministered to somebody else and they ministered to somebody else. And all these people in this big long line, they're all going to be up there because of you, because you made the the uh, very first contact with the very first person who spread it and spread it and more spread it. And, you know, you, you win two or three converts and it probably ends up being a thousand by the time uh, you get to heaven, by the time, you know, this, this earth is over with. Could be a million, you know, who knows? But anyway, that's what the place that you have is important and God wants you to use it. And, and uh, you know, if you influence somebody, uh, you know, today you, you make them a little stronger Christian, they're going to walk closer to the Lord and they're going to do more things for the Lord than they would have done without your help. And so um, you did help them. And so you've increased their potential to uh, reach out and to tell others about the Lord or reach out and to teach and reach out and, and give to be a servant, whatever it is, there's a place for everybody. And the more that you uh, realize that and the more we're willing to use that, the better off everybody's going to be, not just you, but everybody. So there's a place for everybody to carry uh, the load that God has, played, uh, has, has placed upon us. Uh, so, and, and, and Mordecai, he's, he's got a lot of faith here. He says, it doesn't really matter, Esther, what your response is in the, in the sense that the Jews are going to be saved. He said, God's going to save them one way or the other, with or without your help. God's going to, to save them. Uh, and he said, but if you don't do what you're supposed to do, you won't be a part of that work that saves the Jewish people. And you're probably going to end up dying anyway, because uh, if you don't do that, the, the revolt will occur. The people, the uh, law will be passed and a lot of Jews will die and probably you and your family and everybody else will die. Uh, and and um, uh, even though God's not going to wipe out all the Jews, he may wipe you out and your family uh, so you need to act. This is just as good. This action is going to be just as good for you as it is for uh, all the Jewish people. Uh, so we see this. We see what uh, what what her response is uh, in verse 15. It says, so then Esther, then she sent this reply to Mordecai. Um, and her reply has to do with doing what is right, not just what is convenient. So we'll put that up there. So when God calls you to do something, he's not going to make it convenient for you necessarily. It might be convenient, but it probably won't be because he wants you to do things in his strength and not your strength. Uh, there was a, a seminary professor that I had, and he said that, um, let me turn this a little bit more. Maybe you can see that better. Uh, and he said that if God, um, if, if he said God, uh, uh, that God does not call somebody to do a particular task that they can do without his help. Uh, like Moses, Moses couldn't have ever done what he did without God's help. Uh, and so it is, and I guess that's true in a lot of our lives, that if God calls you to do something, he's going to equip you to do it. And it's going to be an impossible task for you to do. But God's glory wants to shine and it will shine because we will carry that out and we won't take the credit for it then. We'll say God is the one who gave us the strength to carry it out. And so 
do what is right, not what is convenient. And so it is with uh, Esther. She came to the conclusion, she came to her senses, and she said, you know, it'd be a lot more convenient just to let this go and not get involved and not risk my life and just, just kind of, you know, case sera, sera, what will be, will be. Uh, but uh, Mordecai said, no, that's not the way that you should look at it, Esther. You should look at it, the fact that this is a, a um, great opportunity for you. And... And, uh, and we can look back on this one. You have a place in God's plan. And then let me put this one up here too. And we'll see the words of Esther that brings this out. It says, there are, there are a more important things than life, than, a phys than physical life. So let me put that up there. So those are the truths that we learn from this. There's the last one, uh, more important things. Like I say, you can pinch these out and you can see them better because I can't. That's as big as I can make them and still fit them on the screen. Uh, but but anyway, uh, so Esther said to, sent this reply, go and assemble all the Jews who can be found in Susa and fast for me. So she knew that it was important that this decision she's going to make will be undergirded with prayer. So she said, go and tell everybody to fast. She didn't say pray, but she said fast for me. And that kind of goes hand in hand. So she said, fast for me. Uh, don't eat or drink for three days night or day. I and my female servants will also fast in the same way. And after that, I will go to the king, even if it is against the law. If I perish, I perish. So Mordecai went and did everything that Esther had commanded him. And so, and so she was willing then to carry this out, you know, what, whatever it was that he wanted her to do, uh, go to the king and try to get the king to get rid of this particular, um, Holocaust that was going to occur. So, so the scriptures don't really go on. Uh, they do, but not not our scriptures. But if you read the, if you read the book of Esther, you'll find out that that um, that Esther did go before the king, and she said, "I would like to have a feast for you because I want to talk to you about some things." And so they had a big banquet, and they had two banquets. And during these banquets, Esther disclosed to the king what Haman had done, and that. And, and she reminded the king, she said, King, don't you remember that Mordecai uh, heard a couple of assassins talking about killing you? And he told you, and because of that, they killed the assassins. So he actually saved your life. And the king goes, oh, yes, I forgot about that. That's true. And he said, well, somebody that's like that, Mordecai like that, wouldn't go against me now. Uh, who said that he's against me? And Esther said, well, Haman has gotten all this stuff going on. And he's going to destroy not only Mordecai, but he's going to kill a bunch of Jews. And now Mordecai, I mean, Haman actually had, it says, some uh, a wooden structure of some sort built. And depending on what's, what uh, version of the Bible you read, some of them say that it was um, to hang somebody like they did in the West. But the Persian way of doing it was a big, long wooden spear or stake, and they would impale a person on it. And, and if you, uh, you know, depending on which, which Bible, some Bible talks about a big stake, you know, that to be put on there. And, that, and that's here again, that's the way that Persians usually would uh, yeah, kill somebody. But it really doesn't matter if they hung them or put them on a stake or whatever. Uh, the point is, that's what he was going to do to Mordecai. Uh, and so she told him that. She told the king that. And he was taken aback by it because he remembered then that Mordecai had helped him. And so he was, uh, um, in, in, instead of having Mordecai executed, he had uh, Haman executed. And so you can see the irony of this whole story. And then he said, I can't get rid of the edict because I already made the edict for, to have this particular day for the Jews to be destroyed. But I can, I can change it at least and say the Jews can arm themselves and fight against the uh, the, the soldiers and the people who come out against them. And so they were allowed to arm themselves and they, they save themselves. And that was, and today the Jews call that the Feast of Purim, P-U-R-I-M. And because that was um, the um, uh, particular uh, dice or what have you that they used or the particular way in which the king was able to uh, decide on what to do. And so anyway, 
uh, like I say, just, just read that book uh, of Esther and you'll see some real excitement there and it'll keep you awake before you get to the end of it because it reads fast and it's uh, very explosive. So you can see the things that have occurred there. You have Esther, uh, who was nothing, who was taken into captivity, who lost her parents, who was an orphan, and yet was adopted by Mordecai because God has a place for everybody and he had a place for Mordecai and he had a place for Esther and they thrived together. And Mordecai was her mentor and did all that he could to allow her the strength that she needed to be a good Jewish person. Uh, and then some problems and difficulties occurred, arose because of jealousy of Haman. And so he was going to have Mordecai and the Jewish people annihilated. And so he, he called upon um, Esther, who knew that it was not important, as important to lose her physical life, because she said, the uh, with the scriptures that I read, it said, if I live, I live, and if I die, I die. Uh, she came to the conclusion that life was not uh, just physical life uh, necessarily, but that there were a lot more things important than just a person's life, uh, the decisions that they made, the uh, differences that they made in life, you know, the the directions that they took. And so we see that in our own lives, you know, that's more important than your physical life. It's the lives that you change spiritually. It's, and, and, and how God drives you with uh, his love and his uh, Holy Spirit to direct you to do the right thing. Uh, it's, it's, sometimes it's hard to take a stand for the Lord, uh, but doing the right thing is not always convenient, which we looked at here. Um, do what is right and not what is just convenient. There's going to be opportunities for you to take a stand for people, and it's it's not going to, um, you know, always work out for you. I remember one time we were voting on the, um, uh, let's see, what are they called? The uh, chairman, I guess, uh, of of the um, of the uh, annual business meeting. The person, you know, who stands up in front of everyone else and. Um, and r runs the meeting, and um, there were votes, two, two people, and one was, you know, seen as this way, and one was seen as that way, and our vote was supposed to be uh, open, you know, you stood up, and I knew if I stood up for this particular guy that I'd be criticized because of the way that a lot of people looked at him, Cons you know, some conservatives wanted this group, uh, th this particular person, the more moderate one of this person. And I knew that no matter what, who you stand up for, um, somebody's going to look down on you and give you grief. And uh, I stood up and voted for the one that I felt would do the best job and that God was leading me to vote for. And I did get some uh, flack about it, but that's that's just the way it goes. And you, sometimes you just have to make those decisions uh, to what's right and not what's necessarily convenient. Uh, and so Esther found that out and she was willing to do whatever it took. So that, that pretty much uh, sums up our lesson today. And I think it gives us a lot of hope and a lot of, of uh, direction and how we can best live our lives. So let's close in a word of prayer. Father, thank you for loving us and for showing us the way and how to be strong and how to be good Christians and how, Lord, to uh, reach out to those around us because we know the decisions we make will affect so many more people. Help us to have the power that you want us to have and the courage that you want us to have as we reach out and we seek your love for those around us. In Jesus' name, amen.